All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast, BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. It's been a very long time since we've mentioned the case of Jonathan Cruz on this particular channel, and when we've been doing uploads on BBOR, I've said very clearly that I have not really been the biggest fan of following other people's work and making responses to other people's true crime uploads. However, the one exception with that is the work of Sheila Waisaki, the private investigator who has been doing a lot on the Lauren Eiji case, but of course the Jonathan Cruz case as well. From time to time on this channel, I will listen to episodes of her podcast without warning about Lauren Eiji and make sort of a response, just some total commentary on what Sheila Waisaki has to say. But the other major case that Sheila Waisaki is involved with is the death of Jonathan Cruz coming to us from Capel, Texas. This is a very um, puzzling case because we know what happened. Jonathan Cruz was 27 years old. He died from a single gunshot to the chest. But the big question is, was it a murder, was it a suicide, or was it an accident? Because from the information that we have gathered, his girlfriend at the time, Brenda Lazaro, was present in the room when the gunshot occurred. And that's just the whole mystery there. Was it a murder? Was it an accident? Was it a suicide? Now, this is one that I really wanted to talk about because I thought that I was really about to nail this one. You know, we put out theories on this channel. We talk about the Zodiac Killer and Jean Benet Ramsey. And I really have to confess again, I've said this many times, it's not that I am write about everything. It's not that I compose the most brilliant true crime theories and that this is has to be the way that it happened. No. It's about raising questions. It's about the kind of what ifs. Well, hey, what about that thing there that in trying to connect some certain dots so we get a larger understanding? I mean, I think that that's what something like this channel can actually do. Is just try and look at the sort of material that we have in the news media and do these ideas make sense? With the case of Jonathan Cruz, though, I really thought, though, that it was coming to a point where it was coming to a point where I could say that I thought that I had it figured out. I thought it had, I had it all figured out. I thought I knew exactly what happened. That was one of the few times that I thought I had composed a theory that was probably spot on with the real life narrative. And you're waiting for it. Wait for it. But however, whatever sort of conjunction you'd like to use, maybe that's not the case. With the case of Jonathan Cruz, um, I was listening to Sheila Waisaki when she appeared on the Lord and Arts channel recently. They were talking about Lauren Agee, but they made some comments about that at the beginning that we'll get to it, that we'll get to later on. But what I would say about this is, I never thought this was a suicide. Once again, this is geared toward people, geared for people who are a little bit more familiar with the case so we can discuss the theories. I never once thought this was a suicide. Highly improbable that this was a suicide. And uh, I was just watching the 2020 segment on Jonathan Cruz prior to this recording. I was re-watching it again, and Sheila Waisaki says very clearly, he was out furniture shopping. He just moved to a new apartment, and those are not signs of suicidal behavior. No, this was not a suicide. The thing is, though, there's the possibility that this was an accidental death, that Jonathan Cruz was somebody who was in a very heated argument with his girlfriend, and he made sort of a, um, a, a judgment mistake. He, made a, he had a lapse in judgment where he's holding a handgun, and he took the magazine clip out of the handgun, put it in the top drawer, and he started making some comments to his girlfriend saying, you want me to show you how much I love you? I can't live without you. And then he pulled the trigger, thinking that the gun was unloaded, and there was actually still a bullet in the chamber, and that went through his chest, and that was the single fatal gunshot that ended his life. The reason why I was really pushing for an accidental death theory, or I really believed in that rather, was it was just the whole nature of the scene. It was like the TV was on, there were two boxes of Chinese food that, was, that were on his nightstand, which was on the left side of the bed. And at the time, my nightstand was also on the left side of the bed, and I was like, well, do people who are right-handed, like who Jonathan... Like Jonathan was right-handed, I'm also right-handed, but when I would reach for things on the nightstand, I would reach for them with my left hand. And like 
That's what I thought would happen. He picked up the gun with his left hand, removed the magazine clip with his right hand, put the magazine clip in the top drawer where it was found. Granted, though, he did have a bunch of silk ties in the drawer, and they think that's kind of weird because he might have been damaging them if he was actually doing some sort of, uh, just a stunt, rather. It's very, very, that's not really the most sensitive word. I wish I had a better word for that. But they, but he takes the magazine clip out with the right hand, puts it in the top drawer, and holding the gun with his left hand, pulls the trigger. That causes his left arm to recoil backwards. And when you look at the reconstruction, like the animations and the kind of reconstruction photos, they're artist renditions, but when you look at that, his left arm is lying on top of the nightstand. The big thing to note is there, were no, there was no powder residue that was found on the left hand. There was some that was found on the right, but it's kind of in a peculiar way that is not consistent with other uh, suicide, suicidal gunshots. The first thing we need to say about powder residue is we saw this very clearly from the case of Jennifer Fairgate. Gunpowder residue, like, it does not always end up on the hands the same way. If someone is, de is delivering a gunshot, it does not always transfer the same way. It is possible to fire a gun without leaving any powder or residue on your hand. I mean, once again, I mean, the case of Jennifer Fairgate explains that a little bit more in detail. But I was really insisting that this was an accidental death. However, a lot of people have been challenging me on that when I was writing about it on forums and such. They're just like, he was telling Brenda Lazaro earlier that, or no, he's telling his friends earlier that he's going to break up with Brenda Lazaro. Why on earth would he say something like, I can't live without you, you want me to show you how much I love you, and do a stunt like that? And the short story to that is, I don't know. I mean, I thought that that was a little bit too much about micromanaging somebody's thinking about... When people are trying to break up with somebody, they don't always do it in a completely organized manner. Sometimes they kind of wait it out to sort of do it at the right time, or what they believe is the right time. I mean, not to mention people have change of hearts. I thought it was a little bit too much to try and micromanage someone's thinking to that point, because I was much more concerned about kind of like the positioning of the body, as well as it seems somewhat plausible that the clip could be removed, but a bullet could still be in the chamber. I'm not a gun expert, but I mean, we've heard that about many different firearms, that if you remove the magazine clip, the, there can still be a bullet in the chamber. So, where does that leave us? Well, I mentioned I was listening to Sheila Wysocki talk about this on the Lord and Arts channel, and Gray Hughes was also present, and what they were just sort of saying is, they're trying to reconstruct this from a forensic standpoint, from a scientific standpoint. Would it have been physically possible for Jonathan to fire that gun and at that particular angle and deliver that fatal shot? You know, it's like, I mean, I would just say I would accept the forensic results no matter what. This is not something where I would, like, try and push my theory to the grave. No, it has nothing to do with me and it has nothing to do with... Even Sheila Wysocki, it's about the truth. And it's like, if he fired that gun with his left hand, I, it just seems like the body would be positioned the way it was. Bear in mind that if he thought the gun was unloaded and he's just doing some sort of gesture, he didn't expect the recoil to be that powerful. I mean, I was, this is one of the few times where I actually kind of tested this thing out. You know, it's like if I were holding something and my arm flew backward the gun would have ended up in that exact same place. The gun's found, like, kind of near his, um... It's kind of near his left shoulder, and it's kind of in between his left shoulder and his chest, still lying on the bed. I thought that was completely consistent with someone firing a gun, not knowing that the gun was still loaded, his arm flies back, lands on the nightstand, and the gun rests on the bed, you know, in between his shoulder and his chest, like... I tested this out, you know, just like, what would happen if my arm recoiled backward while I was holding an object? Because as I mentioned, my arm, my nightstand was on the left-hand side the same way that Jonathan's was. To me, this seemed rather clear that he was a man who got in bed to watch TV and eat dinner. This wasn't anything like, 
This wasn't something so much as he was asleep and Brenda Lazaro shot him. I had such a hard time trying to accept that because I was just like, you're ordering Chinese food and you have two boxes of uneaten Chinese food on your nightstand and you're going to sleep? I don't know about that. I'm very uncertain about that. I mean, that just doesn't sound like typical human behavior. And maybe that's a little bit too much micromanaging in its own right. But the big thing to say is, the forensics might really get an answer to this. Is it possible that Jonathan fired the gun with his right hand at that particular angle? I don't think so. Absolutely not. I mean, I, I think that that's what they're talking about when they, if you ever hear the line that he would have broken his wrist if he had fired the gun with his right hand. I can kind of agree with that. I mean, once again, you know, I have my nightstand on the left-hand side, and I pick up items with my left hand, even though I am right-handed. I think it could be something very similar to that. But the forensics are really going to reveal a lot more of this. One of the things about Sheila Wysocki is, though, you know, she is running her podcast without warning, and I get into some sort of trouble with, you know, when I make responses to the Lauren Agee case. And once again, we're just discussing the ideas that were presented in her podcast. And you're like, well, hey, maybe I'm um, asking a few more questions about this. But she doesn't reveal everything all at once. She wants you to listen to future episodes. So then sometimes people are really just like, what are you talking about? You completely missed this huge piece of information. Well, it wasn't revealed yet. You know, she doesn't give it all away all at once. And um, I might have to scale back some things about the um, Lauren Agee case and probably bite my tongue a little bit on that particular one, on Lauren Agee. But when it comes to Jonathan Cruz, I really think that a lot of people are focusing in very closely on his girlfriend, Brenda Lazaro. It really seems like they are trying to sort of vilify her because she's not a very likable character. She is actually a very, very, let's just say unlikable. I was about to say something much nastier than that, but she's a very unlikable character. And that's something that I think is going to really work against her. And she's sending text messages why wasn't our love mentioned during his funeral? Making weird demands like that. That's not really going to help her at all. I don't think it's weird, though, that Brenda Lazaro didn't attend his funeral. I mean, it's just there were very weird circumstances around Jonathan's death, which she was involved with. She was present in the room when he died. All parties seemed to agree with that. So I'd say the things that work against the possibility of Brenda Lazaro being involved with an accidental death I mean, by that, I mean just an accidental death that happened when Brenda Lazaro was in the room versus Brenda Lazaro pulling the trigger is that just the amount of time that it took her to find the address. And there's also the possibility that Jonathan was shot up to 20 minutes before Brenda Lazaro called 911. And that is sort of based on the neighbors who kind of made the statement that they heard a gunshot. They thought the gunshot was 20 minutes before Brenda Lazaro came knocking on the door or something, or they thought they heard the gunshot 20 minutes before the 911 call, something of that nature. That's working against Brenda Lazaro, definitely. So, I mean, you can hear the 911 call for yourself on things like True Crime Daily and um, 2020, the fragments of it anyway, and it's like, Brenda's very emotional. She doesn't sound like she is... Um, putting on an act. I mean, you'd have to be an Oscar-winning actress to sort of do some of that stuff, but the other things that I noticed that kind of seemed in favor of this being an accident were when they ask her, did he shoot himself intentionally? And then she says, no. Then she says, yes, he did it on purpose. That sounded like kind of describing the theory that we just put forward, that this was an accident that he didn't mean to shoot himself. Well, I mean, he had the gun and he pulled the trigger, but he didn't mean to shoot himself. First she says no, and then she says yes. I mean, I've said very clearly, I do not believe that this was a suicide. If there was any sort of intent going on, this could have been an accidental death. However, a lot of people insist, though. Jonathan was a firearms guy. He knew guns very well. And people who sort of have a high understanding of firearms are not typical to do things like that. Yeah, I agree. The uh, kind of gun enthusiasts that I know, they're all about gun safety. And probably you know some gun enthusiasts in your life who are also all about responsible gun ownership. So does that mean that he is completely incapable of having a lapse in judgment when he's in this very heated argument with his girlfriend? Not quite. 
I mean, it's still possible that things did happen that way, but the forensics really will reveal it. Is it physically possible for him to have fired that gun with his left hand? Um, some time is going to tell with that. I think that it's, um, it's just going to come down to the science of it all, and that will tell us whether or not Brenda Lazaro was the murderer. She seems like someone who could be very guilty. I mentioned she's not likable, but at the same time, though, we've said it on this channel once and we'll say it again, being weird is not a crime. Just because she's an unlikable personality, that doesn't necessarily mean that she fired the gunshot that killed Jonathan Cruz. There's some very suspicious circumstances around his death, and it's also like, one of the things, though, that I don't think is very suspicious is when Sheila Wysocki is pointing out that Brenda Lazaro took a long time to find the address to the place, even though she was uh, one of the people that helped Jonathan find the apartment in the first place. I just moved to a new apartment. I can't tell you the address off the top of my head. I have this little card over there that has my address written down on it. And even back when I was working in a restaurant once, one of the delivery drivers got into an argument with a customer because they were delivering food to the house and the people had lived there for six months and they didn't know the address and they gave them the wrong address. You know, six months living in a place, they didn't know their address. We're human, we do these things. And just because you are, just because you help somebody find an apartment doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be able to even say the apartment complex name. I mean, those things are somewhat normal when it comes to human beings. So, is Brenda Lazaro a murderer? What I can say is, at first, I was completely gung-ho for my theory that this was an accidental death. And I don't really think that a lot of the personality things that they're saying about Brenda Lazaro indicate things of her guilt. I don't really think that that's anything that is pushing me toward thinking that Brenda Lazaro is a murderer. What I would say is that I'm definitely leaning more toward the possibility of it. I would definitely think that a lot of the information that I put forward to you just now, my kind of sort of theoretical this, that, and the other, is kind of suggesting that it's very possible that Brenda Lazaro had some kind of more information that she gave than she gave the police. Maybe her story isn't completely correct. Because in one version, I believe she said she was sitting on, on the floor watching the TV when he pulled the trigger. And in another one, I think that um, she was standing up. So, like, I mean, I think there's some conflicting information there. The fact of the matter is, even though I said I was really all gung-ho for my theory in the past, I'm having some reservations about it. And I'm definitely leaning toward the higher possibility of Brenda Lazaro being involved with this situation in somewhat of a criminal manner. And I think Sheila Wysocki is on the right track with this, with just trying to use the science to solve the case. And that's kind of the fact of the matter right there. But what do you think happened to Jonathan Cruz in Capel, Texas? Do you think that this was a murder, or do you think that this was an accidental death? Um, I think that there is a lot of evidence to support the accidental death theory. I don't think there is any evidence at all to support that this was an intentional suicide. But the fact that, I mean, we'll know the facts once it's completely determined if it is physically possible for him to fire the gun in the way he did. And that will kind of be the sort of hook, line, and sinker answer that a lot of people have been searching for. By a lot of people, I mean his family members. What do you think happened to Jonathan Cruz? Do you think that this was an accidental death, or do you think it was a murder? And do you think that there is any possibility that those neighbors did indeed hear the gunshot 20 minutes before the 911 call? If you have anything to say at all, please drop a comment below. I would love to hear from you, and until next time.